The Royal Mail Ship Queen Mary is the most famous of all transatlantic luxury liners. From the time of her maiden voyage in 1936, the ship has held a unique place in history and in the hearts of the British and American people. She has become the symbol of an era, a magnificent relic of a style of travel that has all but vanished. The Queen Mary is now operated by Rather Port Properties Limited. She's one of the country's foremost tourist attractions, with a hotel and restaurants on board, and many exhibits relating to the ship's extraordinary history. Alongside her is the world's largest geodesic dome, which houses a companion attraction, the Spruce Goose, a famous flying boat built by Howard Hughes. The Queen Mary, once the premier liner of the North Atlantic service, has been permanently berthed here in the harbor of Long Beach, California since 1967. How did this famous British ship find her final home in a Pacific port? Her story actually begins over a century and a half ago. Samuel Cunard, a native of Nova Scotia, founded the British and North American Royal Mail Steam Packet Company in England in 1839. The following year, the tiny paddlewheel steamship Britannia began the Cunard Line's transatlantic service. Charles Dickens, her most famous passenger, was greatly offended by the discomforts of the voyage and described the ship's dining saloon as a hearse with windows. But a parade of great Cunard liners followed in her wake, each faster and more splendid than the last. Among the grandest of them all was the Mauritania, which began service in 1907. For 22 years, she was the fastest passenger ship on the North Atlantic. She was enormously popular and a lovely vessel as well. Her speed record was beaten at last in 1929 by a brand new German liner on her maiden voyage. Five years later, the magnificent Mauritania was retired and broken up for scrap. Construction of the Queen Mary was begun in the shipyard of John Brown of Clydebank near Glasgow, Scotland on December 1st, 1930. From the start, the ship was known only as Job Number 534. She was not given her name until the moment she was launched. A long shutdown caused by the Great Depression delayed her completion. But with financial help from the government, the men were brought back to work and the huge ship was finished at last. On September 26th, 1934, a cold, rainy day, King George V and Queen Mary of England greeted the huge crowd that had come to see the launching of job number 534. It has been the nation's will that she should be completed. And today we can send her forth, no longer a number on the books, but a ship with a name. The time has come for Queen Mary to reveal the name of the new liner. I am happy to name this ship the Queen Mary. I wish to accept to her and to all to sail in her. The Queen presses the button to start the ship down the waves. The River Clyde had to be widened at this point to accommodate the Queen Mary's 1,020-foot length. The vessel is now ready for fitting out, after which she will be an incredible 81,000 tons. The great ship left Southampton for New York on her maiden voyage in late afternoon of May 27, 1936. In service and luxury, she surpassed any liner that had ever put to sea before. Cunard and the British people had every reason to feel proud. 
There was an air of excitement throughout the ship, as if everyone on board knew that history was being made. She arrived in New York on June 1st to an exuberant American reception. The new vessel had become instantly popular. She continued a regular schedule of successful transatlantic crossings for the next three years, vying with the Normandy, pride of the French line, for the title of the fastest liner afloat. World War II broke out in Europe in September 1939. The Queen Mary and the first Queen Elizabeth, Britain's two largest liners, were soon taken into government service as troop transports. Both were radically altered inside and out. This RAF orderly room was formerly the Queen Mary's nursery. In 1942, briefly and for the only time, the three greatest liners ever built, the two Queens with the Normandy at the left, were tied up alongside each other in New York. This is one of the most dramatic pictures in all of maritime history. On October 2nd, 1942, the Queen Mary, with over 10,000 American troops on board, collided with the British cruiser Curaçao, one of her escorts. The cruiser was cut in two. The Queen, obliged to follow standing orders in waters infested with U-boats, could not stop. The Americans rushed to the rails and threw life jackets to their stricken comrades in the water. But the cruiser sank almost at once, and 329 British sailors were lost. After that dreadful tragedy, the Queen Mary's severely damaged bow was repaired, and she returned to her troop-carrying duties. On one Atlantic crossing in 1943, she carried 16,683 people, which, as her log reported dramatically, was the greatest number of human beings ever embarked in one vessel. The Queen Mary was armed with anti-aircraft guns, and the British and American gun crews drilled regularly. Fortunately, the ship was never fired upon and was never obliged to fire a shot at an enemy. The Queen shuttled Allied troops all over the world, usually sailing alone. Her great speed provided more safety than a slower convoy would, and she could easily outrun enemy submarines. She even visited South America. In tropical waters, the ship, which had no air conditioning, became extremely hot below decks. As many veterans recall, conditions on board were unbelievably crowded. Every inch of space was used. Bunks were even jammed into the empty swimming pool. Prime Minister Winston Churchill made several wartime crossings in the ship en route to conferences with President Franklin D. Roosevelt. On one of his trips, a North Atlantic gale slammed a monstrous wave broadside against the Queen. The great ship heeled over until her upper decks were awash. And then at long last, she slowly righted herself again. With the end of World War II in 1945, the Queen Mary engaged in the happy task of carrying American GIs back to the States. Many men were wounded, and sick bay, once the ship's first-class main lounge, was packed. For every man on board, time couldn't pass fast enough. The war was over at last, and they were going home. The Queen Mary's final military service was a series of voyages in 1946, bringing British war brides across the Atlantic to join their husbands in the United States and Canada. Altogether, the ship transported more than 30,000 brides and babies. Perhaps on these trips, 
more than on any others in her whole career, the ship carried with her a greater cargo of happiness and eager anticipation. The Queen Mary underwent refitting for her return to transatlantic passenger service. She was repainted in the black, white, and red colors of peacetime. During the war, she and the Queen Elizabeth had transported about one and one half million troops, all told. Winston Churchill paid glowing tribute to the wartime work of both gallant vessels. Without their aid, he said, the day of final victory must unquestionably have been postponed. When she left Liverpool in the summer of 1947 on her first post-war commercial voyage, her suites and first-class staterooms were even more luxurious than before. The most expensive accommodations could run as high as $5,000 round trip. Newly redecorated suites and staterooms, their walls gleaming with paneling and inlays, showed in exquisite workmanship why the great vessel had always been known as the Ship of Beautiful Woods. The bath provided not only hot and cold fresh water, but hot and cold salt water as well. And a warm salt water soak was said to be very relaxing. But there were, of course, three classes of passengers, each with different accommodations and separate public rooms, and the three mixed only at Sunday services. For first-class passengers, the tone was quite formal, one dressed for dinner. Later in the evening, there would be dancing or a festive party, perhaps followed by a game of cards in one of the ship's lavish public rooms. The private accommodations of the captain's cabin were surprisingly spartan, considering his position. An invitation to visit his sitting room for tea was extended to many distinguished passengers. The Duke and Duchess of Windsor often sailed on the Queen Mary, as well as famous figures of the entertainment world on both sides of the Atlantic, including Gloria Swanson, Noel Coward, Fred Astaire, and Laurel and Hardy. Bob Hope often found time to entertain his fellow passengers. In August 1938, the Queen Mary had been the first passenger steamship ever to cross the Atlantic in less than four days. Her average speed then was over 31 and one half knots. For the 20 years of her post-war career, she continued to be a fast and comfortable ship carrying on with the Queen Elizabeth the weekly transatlantic service for which the two great vessels had originally been designed. But the golden age of the great ocean liners was waning. By the 1960s, people who were in a hurry, and nearly everyone was, could fly between America and Europe in a matter of hours. Ocean travel was now too slow. Leisurely shipboard luxury fell out of favor. And the Times of London called the Queen Mary and her companions in the Atlantic service limping leviathan. Passenger revenues plummeted. The ship was losing three quarters of a million pounds a year. And in May 1967, when she was 31 years old, she was taken out of service. The possibility grew that she might be scrapped. At very nearly the last minute, the city of Long Beach bought the vessel from Cunard. The Queen Mary would be moored at that California port to serve as a convention center and tourist attraction. Thousands of well-wishers came to say goodbye when the Queen Mary left her home port for the last time.
she was too big for the Panama Canal. On her final voyage of 40 days and more than 14,500 miles, she carried nearly 1,500 passengers through the storms of Cape Horn and around South America. She arrived at Long Beach to a tumultuous welcome, and a vast flotilla of small craft escorted her to her new home in the New World. The liner was put into dry dock in the U.S. Naval Shipyard in Long Beach, the only dock in California large enough to accommodate her. Her bottom was cleaned and prepared for permanent berthing. Parts of the Queen Mary's interior had to be renovated before she would be ready for her new career and this was accomplished by first removing her three huge stacks. The vessel would never again sail under her own power, and space was needed inside her for museum exhibits and convention facilities. Her boilers and two of her four power plants were taken out. When her new aluminum stacks were all in place, the time had come for the Queen Mary to be moved for the last time. Small boat owners and people from the news media flocked to Long Beach Harbor. The huge ship, guided carefully by a squadron of tugboats, moved slowly and majestically toward her permanent home at Pier J. Her new berth, with its access towers and mooring facilities, was all ready for her. Actress Greer Garson, as elegantly British as the Queen Mary herself, was hostess of the installation ceremonies. Ship enthusiasts realized with a pang of sorrow that this was the Queen Mary's final mooring. She would never leave this site. And yet, everyone who has ever seen the great ship and responded to her beauty is surely grateful that she has not shared the tragic fate of the Mauritania. Here at Pier J, inside her own breakwater, the Queen Mary would be safe from all danger. The vessel was later leased from the city of Long Beach by the Rather Corporation, and is now operated not only as an attraction, but also as a first-class hotel. are nearly 400 rooms, all of which are refurbished staterooms, carefully maintained as they were when the ship was in service. There are also several excellent restaurants on board. One of the greatest ships in history is here for the viewing, open for both guided and self-guided tours, as well as scheduled talks and demonstrations by ship's officers on a variety of nautical subjects, including knots and signals. Uniformed personnel are on hand at key locations to answer questions. There are interesting shops in Piccadilly Circus and elsewhere on the prom deck. The coastal setting here at Long Beach is filled with variety and interest. And on clear days, there are some truly astonishing views. The wheelhouse, which was off-limits to passengers when the vessel was underway, is now a high point of the ship's tour. All instruments and brasswork are kept flawlessly polished in true maritime fashion. The navigating bridge, too, is for ship's crew only. 
It was from here that the captain and the pilot often conned the ship during her arrivals and departures from port. The outboard ends of the navigating bridge extend beyond the ship's sides, and you can stand there and look straight down to the water. Shipboard visitors always enjoy meeting Captain John Gregory, genial host of the Queen Mary. Every visitor should have a stroll on the prom deck. With a little imagination, it's almost possible to feel the ship roll a bit under your feet, as if she were still plowing through the North Atlantic swells. Much of the forward deck gear of the ship looks just as it did when she was at sea. The anchor winches and chains are truly enormous, and they needed to be. Each of her two bow anchors weighs 16 tons. There are many reminders on board of the Queen Mary's illustrious wartime career. A 40 millimeter anti-aircraft gun is set up aft on the sun deck near the veranda grill. It seems to have made a special hit with the youngsters. Farther forward on the sun deck, there are extensive exhibits relating to the war, and shipboard scenes have been recreated that stir the memories of those veterans, British and American alike, who visit the vessel. A number of the scenes are based on documentary photographs of the period. At the start of every voyage, passengers were required to try on life jackets and to participate in a lifeboat drill so they would know what to do in an emergency. Experienced officers now conduct demonstrations of these procedures and even lower one of the Queen's lifeboats some distance over the side. An ocean liner is actually a city at sea. Every eventuality had to be foreseen for the convenience, health, and safety of the passengers. There were beauty shops and barber shops, fully equipped and staffed. There was a doctor's dispensary on board, an infirmary, and even a small operating room with a surgeon on call. The Queen also boasted a number of luxuries one might not expect. This exhibit duplicates a corner of the gymnasium with original exercise equipment. Fitness-oriented passengers could enjoy a brisk run around the promenade deck. Four complete laps were equal to a mile. In the chilly air of the North Atlantic, that must have been a stimulating experience. A visit to the Queen Mary's cavernous engine room is always an exciting part of any visitor's tour. This area and the bridge were quite literally the two nerve centers of the ship. Here, deep in the bowels of the ship, you can see much of the gigantic machinery that was used to drive and steer her. Few passengers ever saw this place. The ship's wireless room is now an active ham radio station, call letters W6RO, operated by the Associated Radio Amateurs of Long Beach. Some of the Queen Mary's original radio gear is still here, although it has been supplemented by modern equipment. Paul Lincoln, master ship model maker and consultant in maritime history, works in his shop on board the Queen Mary. The model here is of the Triumph, a British 74-gun ship of the line launched in 1764. All parts are handcrafted by Paul himself. When the model is completed, three and a half years' work will have gone into it, and its value will be $150,000. The Grand Salon, seen here as it was in the 30s, is the largest room on any passenger ship. This was the first class dining room, and the evening meal here was always a gala event. 
the room still looks very much as it did then. It's used now for meetings and banquets, and following the elegant Queen Mary tradition, a champagne brunch is served here every Sunday in a comfortably informal atmosphere. The brunch is rated as one of the finest anywhere. The Observation Lounge, considered by many visitors to be the most colorful and exciting room on the ship, is located on the prom deck. This was the cocktail bar for first-class passengers, and the atmosphere and art deco elegance of the 30s have been carefully preserved. The lounge is open to the public with dancing and musical entertainment in the evening. The Queen Mary's Wedding Chapel is frequently booked for weddings which are performed by Captain Gregory. Receptions afterward are often held in one of the original banquet rooms on board. On shore, adjacent to both the Queen Mary and the Spruce Goose, is London Town, where the buildings are charming reproductions of those in an old English village. There are all sorts of fascinating architectural details that photographers in particular will enjoy. London Town offers a variety of fascinating gift and souvenir shops and several inviting restaurants, including the English pub. In the years of her North Atlantic service, the Queen Mary was a speedy and reliable link between two countries that share a common heritage. It's been said that no other ship since the Mayflower has been held in such affectionate regard on both sides of the ocean. Born in Great Britain, now permanently docked in America, the gallant Queen Mary links us still. She's a priceless maritime treasure, a technological triumph in mankind's eternal struggle with the sea. Those who love ships can only stand and admire her, handsome, regal, justifiably proud, and feel thankful that she's still with us. She will always be queen of the sea.